Good morning. Our session today titled A New Standard for Public Education. We're going to talk about the gaps in quality between private and public schooling in the Middle East and North Africa that are creating inefficiencies in the labor market and dampening growth in the region. How can public and private uh, cooperation create a new standard for education to prepare youth for the next generation of jobs? This is Hamoud Al Mahmoud, editor in chief of Harvard Business Review Arabia, a <coughs> moderator. I'm also a group editor in chief of alaqtisadi.com. I'm going to start introducing uh, this session by telling you two short stories. First, about an individual named Peter Tabishi. You can Google him. This man from Kenya, he was not known at all outside of Kenya uh, until uh, the recent few days ago <coughs> when he won the prize of the global teacher uh, that equal $1 million. But his story, very interesting. I'm going to take just a short of it. He was teaching at a private school, and he saw the a huge gap between private and public schools in his country. He decided to do something himself. He left the private school and he went to his village to teach at uh, the public school his village uh, has. Uh, he, he is a science teacher. He really made it uh, transformational uh, in his country. Now uh, he just saw uh, his accomplishments um, after years of dedicating his time for this. Now, um, uh, his school uh, comes first uh, in public schools in, in his country. Uh, the mathematical science team from his school uh, now participating in Intel, International Science and Engineering Fair uh, 2019 in Arizona. Uh, also, um, his uh, school and a specific team uh, from his school won the Royal Society uh, Award, uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry Award. Um, this is an individual. Uh, he is li like a, a, a living proof about <coughs> uh, the willingness and the perseverance of an individual who can do something uh, on the scale of his village. On the scale of a state, or let's say a state level, we have a Vietnam as an example. Uh, recently, the World Bank um, showed in uh, the Human Capital uh, Index that Vietnam is escalating very quickly and improving very quickly in the uh, Human Capital Index. And thanks for the education quality they have. So the education quality uh, in Vietnam uh, now getting better and better every year. Uh, both uh, stories of the, this individual, um, Peter Tabishi and Vietnam, showing that you don't need a huge resources, a huge budge budget uh, to make a better quality of education. You need uh, willingness, uh, perseverance, uh, planning, and so on. We're going to talk today about this gap in our region, which uh, we've been talking about maybe uh, uh, for a long time, and we'll, we're, we're trying to, uh, in this session, to crack down what is the uh, real problem behind uh, um, the standstill uh, we have in this region not moving forward. We're going to talk uh, about uh, the widening access to early childhood education, investing in digital fluency, ICT literacy skills, creating culture uh, of long life uh, learning. We have a very uh, wide uh, range of uh, expertise and backgrounds here. Uh, we, we are going to have um, uh, um, Hassan Hasbani, Deputy Prime Minister. He's coming on his way. Uh, we'll introduce him. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he has a background, uh, international background, actually. He worked for uh, many uh, research and uh, uh, digital economy uh, companies, uh, uh, Booz and Co. Uh, he was a CEO at STC Saudi Arabia. He worked for Aspen Institute, uh, Engineering and Technology in UK, and uh, 
uh, he also has an expertise in uh, 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 multiple uh, Asian and international and Middle Eastern companies. Um, uh, uh, Tony Chan, welcome. Um, our guest here, he's a president of King, uh, King Abdullah University of Science and Technology, KAUST. Uh, Tony Chan came uh, recently uh, from Shanghai University uh, 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 of Science and Technology, which is Hong Kong. Hong Kong, Hong Kong, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Hong Kong, which is uh, one of the top uh, universities uh, uh, in this uh, aspect in, in the world. Uh, Maisa Jalbut, uh, welcome, Maisa. Uh, Maisa uh, is the CEO of uh, Abdullah Al Ghareer Foundation uh, for Education. She is uh, also uh, a, an active uh, expert and uh, a member at uh, Brookings uh, Institute. Uh, she's done a lot of uh, research and uh, actions on, on the education in the region. Uh, Marita uh, Mitz Chen, um, Senior Vice President, Digital Skills, uh, Emma South, uh, Managing Director, SAB Training and Development Institute. Uh, she's also a member of SAB's Global Executive Leadership Team. Welcome. Uh, John Sexton, the uh, president, of, uh, president uh, emeritus uh, of New York University, USA, and he is also co-chair of uh, University of People. Uh, so he has uh, um, uh, um, multiple uh, and, and different uh, backgrounds we can, he can share with us. Uh, I, uh, I invite you, um, Welcome, uh, Mr. Ghassan Hasbani. We just introduced you to the audience so they know <laughs> the rich expertise you have. Um, so, uh, uh, as we said, uh, we're going to talk about this uh, gap between uh, private and public schoolings. Uh, and I invite you to prepare your questions. You're going to be part of this at, uh, in the last 20 minutes as uh, the audience, I, I know. Uh, for sure, some of you, and uh, I'm, 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 I'm confident uh, that you have uh, a very rich expertise that you can share uh, and ask questions uh, too. Um, I'm going to let you uh, take some uh, breath. I, I, I prepared to have you at, uh, at the first one to ask, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to make it up. Uh, you can. I can wait. Okay. So we're going to start with Mesa. Mesa, we've been talking about uh, this gap between private and public schoolings for a long time. And you have uh, um, uh, regional and global expertise in, uh, in this matter. Um, uh, what is uh, missing uh, uh, for uh, the, the, the education uh, regulators or decision makers not to take an action so far? And what are you as... Uh, Abdullah Ghari Foundation for Education trying to fill in. When we see a man like Abdullah Ghari donated $1 billion just to establish this foundation, did he get desperate from uh, the, the, the school uh, system in the region? Uh, I'm provoking you, I know. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, I was supposed to respond to after, the, after one of the uh, yeah. government representatives spoke about that. But um, look, I think um, the challenges that we face in the region in education are not new. We've been talking about them um, here at the World Economic Forum, at the Dead Sea for a very long time. Um, but what is new is that the, um, the way education is being delivered is changing very, very rapidly. But we in the region are still talking about the same old challenges. So not only now do we have to um, overcome the challenges that we are facing, but we also have to catch up with the way education is being delivered at the global level. Um, what I'm really happy about today is that we're not focusing our discussion just on the outcomes of universities and the entry point into the workplace because the discussion today needs to start at the very, very early stage in early childhood education, and then continue on to look at the very specific challenges that we face in every phase. So let me start with early childhood education. And this we know to be the most important investment that you can make in education. 
the return on every year of early childhood education is higher <coughs> than any other level of education. Yet our investments in the region continue to overlook that. So the Arab world is actually has, has the lowest enrollment rate next to South Asia. So we're um, at 31% today as opposed to 49% globally. So this is huge. And then when you look into that a little more deeply, you'll see that the vast majority of children who have access to early childhood education are in private schooling or, or private uh, providers um, at, at the rate of 70% almost. When you compare that globally, it's actually reversed. So 70% of young children who are enrolled in public early childhood education on a global level um, are at the rate of 70% in the public versus the other way around in the region. So already inequity to education starts at that very early age. And then it just carries on and has that ripple effect as you go through. Mm -hmm. So we know that for every year of uh, education in early childhood, as I said, the return is higher, but it makes a real difference in attainment. So we know that if you have one year of early childhood, you, your reading scores are 30 points higher in primary education. Then you move to primary education, and recently in the, in the Brookings Institute, I co-authored a report that showed that um, you know, we've done well in the Arab world uh, around access. <coughs> But where our biggest challenge is, is in the learning outcomes. So 50% of children who are in primary education, if you look at PISA and TIM scores, are actually not learning at the level that they need to be learning. So they have very poor uh, literacy and numeracy rates. You mentioned in this report, uh, this reveals an important reason behind the dropout rate in lower secondary uh, schools. Is that yeah. right? Yes. What is the t status now? I mean, it's, uh, it was, this report was in 2014, I guess. Correct. So is it now a bigger um, gap? Uh, right. Um, so at that time... Uh, because the technology is growing very fast and uh, the, the, the new skills needed are, are, are accumulating every day. Correct. That report looked at uh, basic numeracy and, and literacy. And what we found is that 50% of students are not meeting basic numeracy and literacy in grade eight. Um, but obviously, education ha the, the, the requirements of the learning outcomes of education are changing today. But the basic numeracy and literacy are still you know, the, the same requirement. Um, but what has changed uh, since, the, um, since that report came out is that today uh, almost 50% of children in the Arab world are living in conflict-affected countries. Mm -hmm. And so we've actually um, had huge losses in access to education, <clears throat> whereas that report said that we're doing not too badly in, in, in access by comparison to global levels. So in addition to the quality of education and the poor learning outcomes, we now have a major crisis in access to education, uh, whereby uh, if you look at uh, populations of refugees, such as uh, Syrian refugees in Lebanon and Jordan, um, if you're 14 and above, your access is 5%, right? So it's, it's extremely challenging, but the good news is that there are lots and lots of opportunities. You know, the advancement of technology in education provides um, huge opportunities for the region to, to catch up uh, and to uh, integrate education in a way that it can have an impact, not only on access, but also on learning outcomes. Great, let me, um, uh, maybe we're gonna talk more about uh, the quality, but let me ask uh, Deputy Prime Minister Ghassan uh, as, as we said, uh, you know, um, uh, we, we just showed an example before you came about uh, Vietnam and an individual who won the prize uh, as uh, the best teacher. Uh, both uh, uh, individual and uh, uh, Vietnam uh, case showing that you don't need a huge resources to make better quality of education. So it needs something else, maybe planning, willingness, and mm -hmm. so on. So you came from a background of a businessman, a digital economy guy. You know what is the difference when you, when you came to the government. So tell us, 
um, what is needed to, to make governments mm. take actions. Today, governments are struggling between getting the basics done, setting the policy to catch up with changes that are happening, and dealing in the region, particularly dealing with emerging conflicts, as uh, you rightly said, uh, particularly with children and who, who live in conflict uh, regions. So you have this fast-moving progress in the fourth industrial revolution happening, and you need to prepare the new generation for it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you have these conflicts, on the other hand, where you cannot just stop everything while the conflicts are uh, ongoing. And yes, indeed, uh, while looking at, for example, the situation in, uh, in Lebanon, as an example, with uh, a large amount of Syrian refugees in the country, uh, displaced people from Syria, more than around 40% of the Lebanese population now, they account for that much, being displaced people from uh, Syria, particularly. Um, and, and, and you see the conditions that they have to go through now to get education outside their home country. Um, and this is placing a lot of pressure on the infrastructure, on the system, etc. The best way governments can actually deal with this is to start leapfrogging uh, evolutionary steps. And usually you leapfrog when the situation is really bad. So instead of trying to take a, an evolutionary progress to catch up or to try to mimic other situations in the world, you can start thinking out of the box effectively. And to do that, technology is usually the answer. Uh, when we talk about literacy, for example, reading and writing are quite basic, mathematics, etc. But new methods of teaching and learning online, digital methods, make that much easier. Plus, preparing the generations for the next challenges requires a lot of visualization, requires a lot of uh, structured thinking. Um, and uh, with, with object-oriented uh, software... But and talking activities. about these issues, you are now inside the government. Yeah. Uh, are the governments in the region re resilient to uh, accept the new regulations to facilitate online Look when education. It's, and, it's uh, not on. as easy. And there's a big role for the private sector in that. The private sector is actually taking the lead and driving governments to start thinking about these methods and uh, approaches. And necessity, urgency, creates the need and helps in setting things up uh, much quicker than you would do in a normal situation if everything was, was going as normal. So effectively, uh, experiences like the ones we've seen in places like India and the ones you've mentioned, where basics can be used or, or basic technology can be used to help advance education, particularly at the literacy level, uh, this could be an area where governments can actually start focusing on. Introducing digital education from a very early age. It's not about computer literacy uh, in secondary school. We're talking about much, much earlier uh, to solve the basic issues and create wider access. We're not talking about technology as a very advanced um, uh, content that is introduced within the curriculum uh, for the privileged students in private schools. We're talking here about really um, necess necessary education in the uh, most vulnerable communities where technology can actually help them reach good results. I'll give you an example. In India, they had the experiment, the, uh, the, uh, the interactive school, which is a terminal similar to an ATM machine that they placed in the poorest neighborhoods and just left it there. Children would come and play on the touch screen and, and, and learn from it. And they were able within a few years to get them to the same <coughs> level of outcome as primary school uh, students in Europe. And effectively, this was a self-learning approach. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that can be done, but where governments can come in, they need a lot of support from the private sector, no doubt. Uh, public education needs to be uh, adapted to these changes. I believe necessity is helping in some countries to start ado adopting these uh, kind of innovative approaches, um, non-standard approaches that could then become mainstream uh, at a later stage. So we could benefit from the crises that are taking place in the region. Uh, one of the positive things that you can learn from these crises is that you can accelerate certain developments and then put them within the mainstream 
education process. Great. Let, let me uh, ask you, um, uh, Tony, you came recently from Hong Kong, uh, University of Science and Technology, very successful on the top on QS, and you came also to uh, a very uh, prestigious uh, university, KAUST, um, also escalating very quickly. Uh, I mean, uh, both universities here and Hong Kong, they are both uh, very high uh, standards. If we want to decode the successful formula of successful universities of school, what, what can you tell us? What is the secret? Uh, Thank you. I was uh, making a comment between Hong Kong and uh, this region uh, yeah. this morning at the co-chair meeting. Okay. You know, Hong Kong, uh, as you know, is governed by the one country, two system. I think the two system is political system. Yeah. I think in this part of the world, uh, especially in education, and, and there's a forward-looking system and a legacy system that we were sort of highlighting. You know, a lot of the, this region is looking forward, as you were thinking, uh, saying, but there's also the cultural tradition uh, or way of doing it. So KAUST, uh, when KAUST was founded only about 10 years ago, it was, it was definitely the forward-looking part. You know, it was King Abdullah's vision of reviving the Islamic House of Wisdom, in making it international, inviting the world to come, uh, let them do what they want. And then at the same time, to make a real contribution to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's economy and so on. So I think you need these two. So in terms of the recipe, you've you got to be forward-looking. You have to be uh, global, uh, especially in science and technology. That's not, it's not good enough to be just regionally best. You have to be uh, global. You have to invite the world to come in. Uh, so now, uh, after I've been in the, in the region for a little while, uh, I'm thinking it's actually we have to work harder to remain in the forefront. Because mm -hmm. uh, not only in the kingdoms, definitely in the kingdom, you know, the country is moving very fast going forward. There's Vision 2030 and many part countries in this region are having their own plan. So if we stand still, we'll fall behind. So, but I want to comment on uh, sort of the, the aspect that came up. Uh, education obviously is a key part in all these strategic plans. I mean, that's a good news. Mm -hmm. All the government society realize that that's true. But it actually uh, has to be uh, multi-generational. You know, I, I'm speaking as a head of a university, which is a research university. So obviously that's very important. It's important for one simple reason. It, it, you, you, in this part of the world, in many parts of the developing world, the quickest way to get on with the fourth industrial revolution is to import technology. Right? You, developing takes too long. So you, you buy them if you have the resources. You bring in the people, consultants, and so on, you do it. But I think if you don't develop your indigenous you know, capability, you, you, you cannot sustain it. That's number one. That's what research university like Kaos exists for. But I think it's not enough just to stay at the research university level. You have to go all the way to really kindergarten. It has to do with the mindset. Uh, I've always uh, advocated this notion, you know, I I'm uh, known as a mathematician. You know, children have to learn math. Very few of them become mathematicians. In fact, many of them will never use math. <laughs> I'm sure people complain. But they have to learn math because it's the mindset. It's opening their mind. It's not the technicality. So I think in this age of fourth industrial revolution, they have to learn a new kind of math. I call it algorithmic thinking or computational thinking. I remind people, algorithm is an Arabic word. Yes. It started in this part of the world. Right. Okay. Uh, so this is to, not about literacy so much. I think that was mentioned. It's not about just knowing how to play a computer game, knowing how to handle your smartphone. You have to understand what goes on inside. And if you, you know, motivate the young people, that's what you, you, you can develop the next generation. Yeah, I'll come back to this uh, maybe while talking um, uh, broadly on, uh, on this, uh, the new skills needed. But uh, I'm going to move also to John. You have the same, let's say, two um, feet. Uh, um, you, you, you are in New York University in, in uh, New York, and uh, you are also in Abu Dhabi with New York University Abu Dhabi. You're teaching, as, uh, as I know. Uh, so tell us what, 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 what you saw difference between the two uh, sides or, 
of uh, NYU. Uh, and what we need here in the region to have this high standard uh, of education, do we need to have a branch of uh, a famous university in every city in the region? <laughs> Well, I, I'm here in a way representing many worlds yeah. because uh, New York University uh, is, uh, it surprises people, a private university. Mm -hmm. It's not a public university. Although in Abu Dhabi, we have a partnership with the government, which makes us a public university in a way. Yeah. And then I'm here representing as well an extraordinary institution called the University of the People which is an accredited American university, all online, high quality, which is free, and which reaches out into 200 countries and the most remote areas of the world, teaching homeless people and uh, people in refugee camps, uh, even as bombing is going on sometimes around them. Uh, and then I come as well from work I'm doing with Prime Minister Gordon Brown on the general problem of the lost generation, hundreds of millions of children. So let me take that perspective and to, to the panel, which almost presents intention, public and private, and, and, and say this is an all hands on deck issue. There is no tension between public and private. In, in, in a way, you could recalibrate the question that you're asking in the panel from pre-K right through and, and, and say, what does the private education sector tell us we ought to be doing in the public education sector? Why is there a migration to the private by those that have the choice? Yeah. Always follow those that have the choice. And, and I would say that education generally, pre-K right through the most advanced universities on the planet, okay, education generally is something we know how to do. It's simply whether we have the will to do it. And I worry about two Ps that come into the equation. Uh, privilege and politics, because the privileged tend to take care of their own, and they can pay the premium for extraordinary teachers, extraordinary educational opportunities uh, for their children. And the politicians, faced with the effects of that, sometimes tend to solutions that uh, appear good, and maybe even appear good in detailed reports from distinguished institutions like uh, Kaust or NYU or Brookings or whatever, uh, but the reality on the ground isn't as good as it seems. So I've been in remote villages in Vietnam, which you praised, where there's uh, nominal adherence to the sustainable development goals, but when you get into the villages, you find out that although education it nominally is free, right through high school, the teachers are so poorly paid that they charge the children for the homework sheets mm -hmm. that they send at home at night, which the children can't pay. So only the children of certain people in the village can get to do the homework. And then you even get into things like paying for grades. Mm. So the big picture globally and in this region is we have to worry about the privileged isolating themselves in the area of education which is successful, and we know how to do this. This is not like some disease where we have to develop a cure. We know how to do this, okay? And the politicians settling for what seem to be good, good results. There is a worldwide disinvestment in thought and education and the status of teachers and their compensation, all of this is trending in the wrong direction. There are exceptions, the jewels like Kaust, where massive investment is made. But what's needed is systemic recalibration, beginning with pre-K and running right through, and, and, and using 
the leapfrog ability. But here you run into what are by definition bureaucrats who are in the old system who want to put the brake on the leapfrogging. Yeah. So, so, so they, they, re, they refuse to uh, offer accreditation or validation of what's going on. So what's needed is bold leaders who will go out and will demand for every child what they want for their own. Indeed. We should not have the educational equivalent of fighting wars with other people's children where we relegate the children of other people to less good options. And that's where the public-private interaction comes into play because I think in the privates, you can see what the people with all the options and all the resources Excellent. can do. That's out of Plato's cave. Yeah, um, uh, Marita, maybe you have, uh, I mean, as Saab, you worked with the governments, you worked with the private sector, uh, trying to uh, provide solutions uh, to enable the education systems and students for the, uh, and to qualify them for the skills needed in the future. Uh, um, and according to the WEF uh, report uh, published 2017, 40% of employers in the region indicate that the skills gaps are a major impediment uh, to a business, the business growth in the region. Tell us what are the skills needed uh, in, um, for, uh, or for the future, what we need uh, to equip our education systems to be prepared for? Yes, so maybe uh, two, two phases here. Um, I come from a background where you have the right of education and where education is free, and where education is free up to university. Ah. So I think to talk about private public, this is no discussion in, in my background. Mm -hmm. Everybody who wants to can have the education. And actually, up to a certain age, you are actually forced to go to school. And if you don't show up, maybe even the police shows up in front of your door and takes you. Mm -hmm. So um, I think this is where our private sector and the country I come from is very, very small. And the education, I think, is quite known for being not too bad, although it's public. Uh, when I look into what is needed, uh, I came to this region eight and a half years ago and I was leading the growth plan for SAP. If you want to excel, you need skills that help you to excel. You can't do it on your own. Yes, of course, you can fly in a 737 from Europe or somewhere else, but it's not what it is. You want to grow the skills in the country that have the cultural awareness and that speak the language. So uh, we have the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. Middle East, North Africa has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world in Saudi counting up to 38%. But these kids have great education. They very often came from international universities. They were sent by their government around the globe. Still, they come back and don't find a job. So this is where I looked into what is missing. So I think what we have started doing many years back, even when I did go to, to basic school, was that we concentrate on grades, on memorizing things, on multiple choice questions, on just putting knowledge in. But what we lacked is to put problem solving skills in, that we can take the different learnings and solve a problem. What we have done as well, we were concentrating on STEM. And we took a lot of other uh, elements out of the learning. For instance, A for art. So I like to put steam back into the system by using art. It can be language, it can be music, it can be painting. But all of these art things will bridge the, the link between the two brains. And this gives you back. So what we did, we took, by now, we have created two and a half thousand places. So we had <coughs> unemployed young people with a bachelor degree, abundance, you can call it, with 39% unemployment rate. We pick the raw diamonds and we run them through a three month boot camp. And there we teach different skills, presentation skills, communication skills, innovation skills, business skills, and of course SAP skills, but the majority is pretty much what we call the soft skills. Uh -huh. And then we find them employment in our ecosystem. And between 2013 and now, we have done this for two and a half thousand young people, previously unemployed, Today, they all have a job. 
So we have a 100% placement rate. So this shows there was a gap that needed to be bridged for the companies to accept them. Yeah, but, but now um, it's been saying that uh, uh, hybrid jobs, new jobs, mm -hmm. still not really fully uh, job description uh, identified. Uh, so it's still hybrid, needs uh, a hybrid education. So can the education system really follow the fast changing of the job descriptions we need? Um, you know, quite interesting enough is that we don't know how the jobs will look like in 30 years from now. Yeah. So pretty much we are educating children on our past, on the knowledge from the past, yeah. because nobody knows how the future will look like. So I think we have to go back and to give them critical thinking, creativity, and problem-solving skills. This paired with basic skills in science, math, literacy, the thinking part has to come back. Metacognition, thinking about thinking. And once you give this to the kids, or the, then you can create and adapt to whatever is out there. Right. So I don't know, just a question. Who uses the skills they learned at university in their jobs today. <laughs> Please raise your hand. No, I mentioned math. <laughs> <laughs> math yes, math is, math is one of the skills that has a different element to it. I know not of people like it. I love it. But it's I not have a technical skill. That's no, it's I not mean. a it's technical. A it's, it's, level com skill. it's combining different elements yeah, yeah. and finding solutions. So, and yeah. this is why I think math is... Yeah, let, let me ask Mesa, maybe this mm -hmm. is something relevant. Mesa, you mentioned in your article published on Harvard Business Review, Arabia, a survey you made at the Lugrer Foundation for Education, Abdullah Lugrer uh, Foundation for Education, that we have like a surplus uh, in the region of the humanitarian majors and studies, over 60%. And uh, are you recommending that should be a shift in our education curriculum uh, toward the new skills, new majors, and this, to build these skills we need? Right. Um, my, the article was basically referring to the fact that young people in this region don't have an opportunity to reflect about uh, the kinds of skills they need for the future and uh, what the job market is demanding. Uh, so they go blindly. Uh, they follow the path of finishing high school and going into university and uh, studying degrees that we know are not going to lead to jobs. Um, I'm a social science graduate, so you're not going to have me say that that's not an important um, type of education. But we at the Abdullah Al-Ghurair Foundation for Education did a study that looked at where are the jobs in the next 10 years. And what we found is for the top jobs in the region, the ones that are um, paying well, the region was continuously recruiting from abroad to fill those positions. So while we have loads of engineers graduating from the university, we're not employing them. So it comes back to quality and comes back to the fact that we're producing young people who uh, are perhaps really good at math and they're really good at exams, but they don't know how to apply those engineering skills to solve problems. And so uh, at the foundation, we focus on supporting underserved young people who do really well in school um, to put them at the best universities in the region. And what we find is that just paying for their education is not enough to make sure that they're successful. We have to work really closely with them to ensure that they um, have the opportunity to uh, develop job skills, uh, to have a mentor, uh, to have um, experience, uh, to volunteer and interact with their community to understand what the challenges that their community faces so they can be part of solving that. So it's about having a holistic education. And believe me, I believe that if you want to study arts, you should go ahead and study arts because the world needs all types of graduates. And here I want to pivot to something that we haven't yet mentioned. Um, this region produces still, and I know we talk about uh, that we have too many university graduates, and I want to correct that. That's a myth. We actually are not producing enough university graduates by comparison to the global average. We're still far behind. What we need is better education. But what we also need 
is much, much better and recognized vocational and technical education. There's still a huge stigma around vocational education in this region, yet we know that um, for every graduate that's coming out of a quality vocational school where they get an internationally certified um, uh, certificate, that's leading to Im almost immediate employment. So we really need to also make sure when we think about uh, education post uh, K-12 to think about all the options that are available. And with that, to come back to what's being said here, is that it doesn't end with a university education. It's about continuous learning. So this is where technology, I believe, more than in the K-12 space, plays a huge role in continuously upgrading the skills of young people so that they can adapt to the needs of the job market. Right. Um, and I just want to mention one more thing. We are huge proponents of using online learning to upgrade the skills of young people in the region. Mm -hmm. um, we've worked with MIT, with Arizona State University, and we're offering scholarships for young people uh, to study in a range of areas that are much, much needed here in the region. Health, uh, health uh, informatics, education technology, supply chain management, all kinds of areas that the region is missing in terms of uh, skills. What we're finding is young people in the region are ready and excited to do that, but the regulations, um, lack of accreditation, um, the, the stigma around uh, the poor quality in the past of online uh, learning is really, really a huge barrier to that. But the good news is, and we've just, uh, we're going to be releasing a study on this very soon based on our own experience with young people who are studying online, is that First of all, employers are reacting very positively to young people studying online. So we're finding that uh, they're, they're finding jobs, uh, particularly because they're studying in these areas I just mentioned. And young people are telling us, uh, almost 50% of young people who took this survey are saying that the quality of education that they received online was better, because these are at graduate level, was better than the quality of education they received in their undergraduate in face-to-face. -face. Right. Let me ask uh, Deputy Prime Minister Ghassan, you are in Lebanon and you have a, a milestone just in front of your eyes, the American University of Beirut. Everybody knows it's one of the top uh, globally. And how, how, I mean, people and you inside the government trying to uh, to leverage the, uh, the public education system, uh, depending on what you already have, I mean, uh, inside Lebanon. One of the uh, high scores on the competitiveness index uh, that we get is on education in Lebanon. And that's uh, reassuring that we can still produce a good quality outcome from the education system with all its challenges and uh, issues that it's facing and all the crises it has to and earlier from the uh, neighboring uh, conflicts. Um, how do we leverage this? It's very difficult to end up creating sufficiently or enough jobs in the small market for the amounts of graduates that we have graduating from universities in Lebanon. Uh, particularly that they graduate with top skills and they can compete on the international level so they are automatically predisposed to working outside Lebanon and competing at a global level. It's not too bad, but uh, in, in, as a result, Lebanon loses the talent uh, from you know, and the, the ability to leverage that talent. So what we keep looking for is always creating opportunities uh, for high-skilled jobs that can help Lebanon also compete uh, economically. And now we're working uh, very uh, seriously uh, on accelerating the uh, digital economy plans, both on the infrastructure level, policy level, and execution uh, level on uh, digital government and digital uh, economy and platforms. But because that is important to leapfrogging also economic development, it's also important for us to have that paralleled in our schooling system, mm -hmm. where uh, digital, digital education is also incorporated not only from the usage side, but also from the development side. But on that point, it's, it's quite important and, and uh, notable to, um, to step back and think about how we face the future, not just in Lebanon, but globally. Um, the future of humanity has always evolved with people 
making the tools and people using the tools. Okay? The tools have changed and are changing now more rapidly than ever before. Uh -huh. So those who are making the tools, the engineers, the designers, the technicians, the scientists, need to receive an education that helps them with critical thinking, helps them with innovative thinking, uh, and breakthrough thinking. It's almost impossible now to prepare students to a job market for the next 20 years, because by the time they graduate from school or university, their skills, as you rightly said, would be almost obsolete. So you, can, you just need to prepare them as much as you can on the skills that will remain useful in the next industrial revolution. One is how to innovate quickly enough, how to link things together and use tools to develop more tools, and that's the engineering side. At the same time, on the more complex side where some jobs or many jobs will actually disappear, we need to start thinking how we can actually prepare them to deal with the next challenges. It's jobs and activities that will re require human interaction, that will require innovation and creativity that will prevail. The mundane right. jobs, the transactional jobs will go. So these are the key challenges that we're facing. And it is an opportunity for people like us in this particular part of the world as well, where maybe the educational systems are not highly developed, again, to leapfrog and catch up with the developments of the new industrial revolutions in, in that way, by focusing on the skills for the tool makers and the skills for the tool users that are maybe different. Right. Let's engage the audience. We'll, we'll, uh, I mean, you'll have a chance to maybe uh, just quick comment. Uh, please start to prepare your questions. Yeah, a quick comment, because uh, I, I cannot agree more with the STEAM and the social science. Let me give you two examples. Pixar, you know, is a marriage between mm. technology and art. Okay, mm. social media. Who would have thought that if you're a student of social sciences, that the Googles of the world would really want to hire you? Google doesn't just hire computer scientists. Yeah. So I think in this age of uh, fourth industrial revolution, it's really man versus machine, mm. and we have human have to focus on what humans are good at. And as a president of a university of science and yeah. technology. I think we need to emphasize on the other part. Yeah, this I, is a question I hope I have a little bit of credibility yeah. in saying that. Yeah. The last thing I want to say is we haven't talked about, we talk about government, politicians, we haven't talked about the private sector. Let me give you three examples on the American front. MIT just announced a $1 billion initiative on AI. And I think uh, they already have something with IBM. Microsoft has started a big thing in Seattle uh, with University of Washington and Tsinghua University. This is global. And Berkeley has always had a close relationship with Google. So what about in the MENA region? Do we have you know, partnerships between education sector and the private sector? It's in each other's mutual interest, okay? The, the private sector, you, you can go one extreme, you just wait, the private sector say, you know, education, you give me the talent. Or like what's happening in AI, they go and hire all the you know, top people from the university. Neither one will work. We okay. need a close partnership in the middle. Right. Let's uh, have a question. Who's first? Please. Make it uh, quick, please, and uh, focused. Uh, Introduce yourself. Good morning. Thank you for the panelists on uh, a very interesting uh, and challenging uh, topic. Uh, my name is Rabia Shamai. I'm a psychiatrist and the head of the National Mental Health Program at the Ministry of Health in Lebanon. And actually, much of what has been debated here is uh, not what a person should learn, but how they should learn and who they are, which means like these higher level cognitive skills and interpersonal skills. So where do you see the investment in mental health, specifically in education, for the younger generation in a society <coughs> that is more and more complex to navigate? Great. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have another question. Uh, so the, the mental health and uh, how to learn, uh, this is a question. Can we have, please? It's tiring for you, I know, but... Uh, can panelist. Uh, my name is Hilal al Riyami, a global shaper from the Masqat Hub in Oman. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur in ed education technology, and I wanted to hear the opinion of the panelists is as uh, Fa Chang said that we spoke about the government, the private sector, how about social entrepreneurs, people who are working in education technology, how can they really collaborate with foundations and the government 
to create an ecosystem where they have, I mean, the government is doing an amazing work in that domain. But I mean, we need to work very closely uh, also with the uh, social entrepreneurs, the young people who are also trying to create an impact in the society. But sometimes the gap in the ecosystem does not allow us to leapfrog or ad advance in that domain. Great. Thank you. This, this is a good point. Uh, Dr. Nabil from Aramco, actually, I was uh, curious if you want to just give us uh, some aspect. Thank you uh, for the panelists. Good morning. My name is Nabil Debel from Saudi Aramco. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about education and others. I tend to agree with Ms. Uh, Maisa uh, Jalbout about the importance of a vocational uh, education. I think in this region, somehow socially, uh, vocational uh, <coughs> training and education is somehow not accepted like in Germany or Netherlands. And I think to improve the economy overall, most of the jobs are needed actually in the vocational rather than in the higher education. How do you deal, how would you recommend to the panelists uh, we deal with the challenge of us as leaders accepting that vocational is just as important as higher education? Thank you. Great, we'll uh, take a uh, woman voice. Uh, <coughs> you raise your hand <laughs> first. Good morning, everyone. I'm Fatim Sara, <coughs> Global Shaper from Rabat Hub, Morocco. I'm actually working for the head of government's office in Morocco, and we recently uh, released a study on um, youth employment. We basically asked the, the youth what they needed, and the answer was really relevant. They just need soft skills and mentoring. So I'm really happy that you, uh, Ms. Maisa, talked about it. I think mentoring is... Uh, uh, the way it, we need to focus on that. I, need in, I think in MENA region we do not really uh, think about monitoring. It's not cultural. And uh, do you think do you think we can uh, in, the in the region think about a way to make it uh, like more? Um, uh, I don't know how to, how to say it, but just to make it cultural that uh, mentoring can is supposed to be. Um, uh, an obligation for, to help the, the youth find their way back to work. Great. Last uh, quick question. So now, now we have two voices from women side. Uh, my name is Sana Hawasli and uh, I'm based in Syria. Uh, actually, I've been working on education and technology since 2014. And uh, we've been running like uh, technology and uh, vocational training for youth through a social uh, initiative in Syria. Actually, my question is, how should we predict what is the most pressing skills needed to be work on with the youth since the market is somehow like uh, there is a lot of unknown unknowns about it and how to measure these uh, trainings that we are doing what are the kpis we should uh, look for and if would be there any standards to work on to make sure that we are doing the right thing and we are setting youth for a better future great thank you so much let's uh Take a uh, last round uh, answering those uh, questions, the things you uh, see relevant to you. Start with you, Maisa. Great. Well, I mean, there's a wide range of questions, all uh, very good. Um, look, I think... Um, One minute for each. We need to go back to the basics uh, with all levels of education. Uh, there are clear measures around uh, learning outcomes. Uh, we know those, we don't need to invent them. We need to make sure that young people have the basics for every level of education. We need to make sure that um, we're providing um, equal opportunity to all young people. One of the things that we haven't mentioned is that if you come from a privileged background in this region, you're three times more likely to be able to go to university than if you come from the lowest economic tier. We cannot forget that. Uh, and this is the same for almost every level of education. Um, so basic learning outcomes, equity in access to education, and then soft skills. But the most important message I want to leave um, with everyone here is that education uh, has a higher goal than preparing young people for jobs. Education is about serving humanity. It's about serving the needs of people, communities, and societies, whether it's K to 12 
or university or vocational, every education institution in this region and around the world needs to prove that it is preparing young people to solve problems that affect them. It needs to be able to show how it's contributing to society. It's not enough to, you know, to, to be measured by the number of graduates or the number of jobs that they produce. They need to be able to show how they're serving humanity. There is a new measure by Times Higher Education that I want to mention. It measures how universities contribute to the sustainable development goals. I think this is a huge welcome opportunity for universities to demonstrate how they're serving the region. And I encourage universities in this region to participate. Thank you, Meza. Prime, Prime Minister Hassan. Well, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, education does have a higher goal than, than the job market. And uh, part of building society and having a good society is to have educated people, educated in so many different ways. Um, and preparing for the future, yes, I think two things that we need to think about really seriously at policy level and action level. One is the mental health, as uh, was mentioned earlier. Because we are preparing people for an unknown future. Disruption. Changing, uh, disruption, basically. Yeah. They need to have the right mental balance and capacity to adapt and modify their skills and approaches. Uh, communication skills, uh, better expression, uh, better um, emotional intelligence that is needed to handle the future challenges. Uh, all of this is, is, is absolutely necessary. Plus, as I said earlier, the tool makers and the tool users. And I, this is predominantly with the tool users. But for the tool makers, more vocational development and training is, is necessary today than ever before. Right. And since the tools are changing, a higher, a higher order of knowledge needs to be developed early on in life to be able to develop the right tools for that future as well. So both are needed, uh, but at a higher order to serve society ultimately. Great. Professor Tony? Yeah, thank you. I want to respond to the question raised by the lady from Syria. Uh, nobody knows how to predict the future. You know, when I was studying, I was a student of computer science. When it was new, nobody knew what it's going to be. So, in a way, my advice to students has always been study the basics. Study what you're passionate about, but keep your eyes open. Continuing lifelong education is most important. You know, uh, you have to be ready when the opportunity comes so you can grasp it. So, the professor do not know. The university do not know what's happening in the future. So, don't think we have all the answers. That's, okay, so. that's a nice comment. Melita? Yes, I would like to come to the vocational training, coming from a country where vocational training is the core of our economy. Um, small, medium enterprises very often coming out of vo vocational trainings and then they have masters of the trade and so on. Um, what I witnessed here over the last years is that these jobs are not really appreciated by the society. So I always say that I had more respect for my plumber or my electrician than maybe for my lawyer. Um, because I need the plumber and the electrician to keep me alive and to keep my house alive and the lawyer I need when I got myself into trouble or somebody got me into trouble. So, but I think the way to do it, it, it will take time because you need the appreciation of the trade in the society to, to take this leap. So what I have been working on over the last years is the in-between which we have created in Germany which is called Duales Studium, dual study. So you learn hands-on at a job while you go to a university and you finish still with a bachelor, which I found is extremely important to parents in this region, right. <laughs> um, that their kids have a, a title. And um, so I think if we not go all the way to vocational training, but maybe take a smaller step to it, then we might get the, the, the way we want to go. Thank you. Professor John? So I come from a family of joyful plumbers and carpenters <laughs> and electricians. Uh, and uh, the, the difference, of course, is that my extraordinarily well-read and intelligent uncles and aunts and cousins chose to do that. Uh, so the first thing that I would say is let's put the whole panoply out. One of the things 
that's developed in the panel is a remarkable consensus around the, the, the kind of breadth, the importance of STEAM, and so on, uh, vocational education included. But I come back to a point that I made earlier. Uh, this should not be something that's dictated by social status. It's something that should be chosen, as my cousins have chosen it. Uh, and of course, as we look to the future, uh, we should be driven to deploy every asset we have. I want to emphasize, this is not something we need to discover how to do. We know how to do this. And in the process of planning for the future, let, 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 let me close by calling our attention to problems that can be solved immediately. So Syria, for example, had before the last uh, 10 years a fairly successful uh, education system and high literacy rates. There are now 1.2 million displaced Syrian children, primary and secondary school age, in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. In the places where they are, are the teachers that were teaching them, are the carpenters that built the school buildings, okay? And yet they are being, by and large, ignored. Uh, there, there is a solution. Uh, Gordon Brown has proposed, and, and we've managed to get to about a third of those children through a double shift school program, where, where school buildings are made available yeah. to we those teachers and children. Thank you. Yes. There, there are a lot yes. of. Uh, but let's, let's solve the problems that can be solved easily, even as right. we plan for there, the. There are a lot uh, to say in this matter. And uh, uh, let me thank you all. I'm uh, going to thank you uh, by saying some positive uh, stuff. There are a lot of uh, initiatives in the region going on. But uh, still, individuals uh, on the individual level of even states. Uh, recently, Dubai issued uh, the strategy for university-free zones to uh, enable universities to create companies and to let students create companies uh, without uh, being under the, the same regulations of establishing companies and startups. Uh, also, we have very successful. Venture Lab at the uh, University of American University of Cairo. Uh, they now, so far, I, I met the, the responsible, but I don't know if he's around. Uh, yesterday, uh, he said they produced uh, almost 150 startups so far, and they received millions of funds. Uh, there's uh, a, a lot of to say in this in this matter. I, I just wanted to let you go uh, with uh, some positive. Uh, Lies. There are a lot of you can see. Thank you so much for our uh, panelists and for you, our audience. And uh, you can also have uh, the break as a chance to talk to our audience. Thank you, Message al uh, Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister Ghassan Khasbani, uh, Professor Tony uh, Chan, and uh, Maritha Miss Chen, and John Sexton. Thank you so much. Hi.